back in the past and then say, Cope, if well, these will let's see how we can use those things from the past to um, apply in the future so we can continue to move forward. So, Brother Brad, would you mind walking us through an ancestor few before we acknowledge them? Yes, indeed. So, I'm honored to do the tribute to Booker T. Washington today. You know, I'm going to just give y'all a few of the major highlights of his life and his accomplishments and some of the major principles that he lived, you know. Um, as a master student, I like to see myself, you know, I was a major follower of, you know, looking into Marcus Garvey. And as a student, I see the greatness that I resonate with. I want to aspire and go to the root of how they fulfill their greatness, you know, when he studied Booker T. Washington. So I went and read Up From Slavery. And it was a monumental story for me to see, you know, how he came from, I think he was released from, he was enslaved, he was born into slavery. I believe he was six when he was, it was free. And he basically just had a real life connected with self-determination. And that era that we were living in, a lot of us had a major expression and representation of self-determination, which is why we've been here to still thrive and move forward and build on our past history. But ultimately, so he's talking about six years old coming from slavery. Um, I think he got, I think it was a teenager at some point. He got his first job in like a coal mine or something like that. He was so determined, like, when he would finish his work, he would rush to the school and get as much education time as he could. And that's how he first learned to read and some of the foundational education principles that he needed. Furthermore, going into college, he went to Hampton University. They, they talk about 400 to 500 miles he had to walk to school, not having nothing but the clothes on his back. And I'm just looking at this. I'm thinking about certain problems that I feel like were major burdens stopping me from where I was supposed to go. And I'm looking at what some of our ancestors had to do and overcome. And I'm like, I gotta pick myself up. And yes, it's obstacles in our way. It's white supremacy, it's, it's systems that are trying to hold us back. But through it all, while we working to change things, we cannot have excuses. There are no excuses. So you talk about he walked 400 to 500 miles to go to college. At Hampton University, it was like a lot of industry that they were learning about. One of the major principles he lived off of was, he said coming out of slavery, some of us, we tried to rush to build the top before we looked to build the bottom. Yeah. So he's like, we rush into politics where it's, it's nothing against that. But he like, we don't got nothing we own and control, we don't got nothing to be political about, you know? So another part of his journey at Hampton University, he had to do a lot of um, like work study that we would commonly know as how we do in modern times, but basically he didn't have the tuition. He had to do a lot of work. Uh, matter of fact, one of the first tasks, I believe before he was even accepted into the school, it was a lady, I can't remember her name, but she gave him a, a mopping job. He had to mop up all these buildings and whatnot, and apparently he did whatever the order was, fulfilled the task. Long story short, they accepted him into the school. He went on to learn these foundational principles around controlling industry, building our own uh, manufacturing and production so we can control our economics. And there was one documentary I was looking at, they had like different reenactments. Uh, matter of fact, I'm gonna fast forward it. So he took those principles and long story short, that led him to the Tuskegee Institute and wanting to, wanting to build an institution that was centered around self-determination developing our own industry. They literally, um, they were showing one skit where he was consulting with a couple of his partners going into this idea and this vision. And they were saying, um, he was basically like, I got this vision, this business plan. We got this amount of money that we need to get. And they were like, we don't got that type of money. How are we gonna get that money, you know? We pulled out the check, I already got the money. So now we just gotta implement and execute the idea and the vision. 
So they went on to buy 100 acres on like the outskirts in Alabama. Um, he also was saying, look, we might not have the money to build the buildings, but we got the land and we can produce the bricks. So literally some of the first students that were part of the Tuskegee University literally had to build some of the next buildings that they needed for dorms and classrooms. They literally took the clay ground that they purchased created a brick furnace and were able to build their buildings along with developing industry okay. that they could further produce income off of. You know, so they started to sell bricks to all of the surrounding areas and whatnot and were able to further produce job opportunities along with creating the funds and the capital that they needed to further develop the school. And to me, it just looked like the proper institution, the proper systems, the proper foundation, and the proper coordination, we can do whatever we put our mind to, you know? So you're talking about, like I said, coming from slavery, and before he transitioned, he still played a major intricate role in establishing the institution that's still feeding and fueling the people to this day. So definitely tap into the story, read Up From Slavery, read all his books, watch the documentaries, and let's implement that type of mentality and self-determination. So, I appreciate it. I didn't let you all know a little bit about me, but um, I am a college professor and I teach at African American African Diaspora Studies Department, so I'm glad to talk about 